we're going to talk about some of the methods and procedures that we need, starting with audits. Both internal and external audits are probably the main process used in many organizations to find the security deficiencies uh, throughout. External audits, most often, for instance, performed by the finance department, usually never even find their way to the information security manager's desk. The controls are required to be tested at least annually, and the security manager must be involved. This is generally a systemic problem throughout most organizations. The results of these tests must be made available to the information security manager to make sure that the program is working as designed and as he indicated to the C-level executives. Along with our audits, we need to have some mechanism for compliance enforcement. It's generally recommended that all programs have a system of self-reporting or voluntary compliance. This generally begins to show trust and goodwill on behalf of the management towards the employees. As with anything else, it needs to be carefully thought out and clearly communicated to all levels of employees. Another critical element to our security strategy is the threat assessments. Our strategy must consider all the different types, nature, and extent of threats that our organization may realize. Coupled with our threat assessment, we also need to perform a vulnerability assessment. This is what most people are most familiar with because it's the scans that are run on the computing devices usually every week or every month. However, they really do have very limited value. Remember, those scans can't show you the vulnerabilities in the processes and facilities, only the technology itself. Now, after you perform both the threat assessment and the vulnerability assessment, it's time to assess the total risk. Uh, management is going to have a decision to make here, whether to accept, mitigate, transfer, or avoid the risk altogether. One of the most popular ways for management to transfer the risk is through the purchase of insurance, usually for high impact events like floods or hurricanes or fires. Keep in mind that none of these exercises are really possible without first doing the business impact assessment. It's much easier to reduce the potential impact of a risk, vice having to mitigate it later. The BIA also helps us determine the criticality and sensitivity of the information housed within the organization. Now, instead of an impact analysis, some organizations opt to do a resource dependency analysis. The advantage to this is it considers resources critical to business operations, not just the general threat itself. The next topic we'll talk about is outsourced services. It is becoming increasingly more popular these days because it allows organizations to focus on their core competencies and let other organizations handle what they do best. Now, however, one of the key problems that we run into with outsourced services is those outsourced functions are lost to the organization inherently making that organization dependent on an outsourced service to continue operations. As the information security manager, you need to fully understand the outsourced security services that your organization has decided on, making sure that there isn't a single point of failure with any one of those services, and also to be able to create a backup plan in the event that one of those providers are unavailable. Some of the sources that organizations have chosen to outsource are things like uh, legal and physical security. Some even contract out compliance and training for their organizations. Remember, even if you do outsource your legal department, the legal and regulatory issues are yours. It's the security manager's job to make sure the organization stays in or at least is aware of the compliance requirements. A lot of the most recent changes in the laws and regulations have to do with privacy and intellectual property. You, as the security manager, must maintain a solid understanding of all the pertinent legal requirements especially if you're an organization that deals with a lot of trans-border data flow. Many countries have restrictions on the types of cartography, for instance, that can traverse their borders. Another aspect that should maintain your attention is your content and retention requirements across the organization. They can often vary depending on the regulation itself. The information security manager must stay current with all of these requirements. It's almost as if the modern information security manager needs a degree in law to practice good cybersecurity. With the rise of civil and criminal actions, you will, at some point in your career, be asked to supply e-discovery. It's simply emails or electronic communications that occur during daily business. 
You need to know what types of communications are protected and you can't turn over without a subpoena. The next thing the information security manager needs to understand is the physical environment itself. Many of these factors often influence or even constrain the information security strategy itself. Uh, factors like space or environmental hazards, uh, consideration for personnel and resource safety. And of course, no discussion about information security can continue without discussing ethics. Uh, ethics often are very subjective things. Uh, however, the organization must be aware of the perception of ethical or unethical behavior by the public. This issue, again, can compound itself, especially when you're dealing with an organization that deals with a lot of international business. However, it is important to understand that an effective strategy will also include ethical considerations considerations. All internal and, dare I say, external culture to the organization must be taken into account when developing the security strategy. Just prepare for the resistance. That resistance must be overcome to reach a successful implementation of our strategy. Another key consideration that we have to take into account is our existing or possibly future organizational structure. Uh, tradition holds that most of our security functions have been held in little silos or rice bowls, I like to call them. Pulling all those rice bowls together is difficult, impossible without senior manager buy-in and total involvement. But remember, the organizational structure itself, if it's not adequate, will have an adverse effect on the governance strategy that we've devised earlier. Yet another consideration that the security manager needs to take into account is the overall cost. Not only the purchase price itself, but the return on investment and the total cost of ownership. Uh, this is where a good cost-benefit analysis comes in. Uh, the ROI just isn't a good approach to justify all security programs. Remembering that the governance and strategy and framework that we're putting together, it, it must be cost-effective to the organization. The only way really to prove that is through a good, solid cost-benefit analysis. Through that cost-benefit analysis, we are going to find our resource advantages and constraints. Uh, what is our current available budget? Uh, what is our future available budget? Uh, what is the cost of the new or possibly additional technologies that we need to employ? Do we have manpower requirements that we're possibly going to need to increase? And what is the total cost of ownership for developing the full life cycle of this strategy? As we begin to answer those questions, especially about manpower, you'll see and start to identify where your capability gaps are. Identifying the known capabilities within the organization will help you identify any possible outsource requirements or possibly even new hire requirements to bring those expertise in. One of the largest constraints that we often run into in the development and implementation of our security strategy is time, often driven by compliance deadlines. This is especially true of organizations that have neglected security for any amount of time. Coming back into compliance can be difficult and normally you'll be racing against the clock. So you've heard me use the terms risk tolerance or appetite for risk several times. That should give you the idea that it's going to play a major role in our strategy as a whole. It's often hard for an organization to truly identify their tolerance for risk or their risk appetite because they're difficult to measure. As I stated before, often you need to develop your recovery time objective for critical systems first. And those need to be based on the business impact or dependency analysis that often organizations neglect to even perform. But all these things are necessary to be able to identify our RTO. The goal is to be able to reduce the RTO to a point to be able to equal the value derived from the operation of the resources. In other words, stay in business. No plan or strategy is complete without a plan of action. Uh, some people might call it a plan of action and milestones. Uh, the implementation of our strategy is going to require probably multiple action plans. Typically, most departments within an organization are going to have to create their own plan and then feed it into the master plan. These action plans help us develop the understanding between our current state to our desired state. 
Some of the metrics to consider when creating your action plans are how are you going to monitor and measure progress along the way? Uh, how are costs going to be monitored? Who's going to control the purse strings? Uh, how are you going to do ongoing monitoring to make sure that everyone is on the same page? Uh, this often is where CMM or a balanced scorecard comes into play. Whatever metrics you decide on, like any other metrics, you must make sure that they are relevant to the action. We're not here to create busy work for people. As the security manager collects everyone's action plans and begins to correlate it for senior management, the thing to keep in mind is attention span. Senior management typically just isn't interested in all the details of the action plan. They want to get down to the bottom line. What's my risk and how much is it going to cost me? Whereas the security manager themselves often are interested in the total policy compliance metrics and the variances to the policy or standards that have been put in place. Keeping in mind that most measures are simply indicative of possible risks and potential impacts. Everything needs to be analyzed and observed to identify whether it's a true risk or maybe we're just chasing a ghost. This is a skill that can only really be learned over time. The improvements to the overall monitoring plan are going to come after careful analysis of all available metrics. You're not going to get it right on the first try. But again, the goal is, is to be able to understand what's right so we know what's wrong. As you design these metrics, just ask yourself a few questions. Like, what is the importance of this information to the information security operations? Uh, what should IT security management be doing? Uh, what does senior management need to know? This is gonna help us read out the extraneous data and get down to what we really need to understand. Again, these action plans are what help us develop our total gap analysis. It shows us our individual maturity levels, either as an organization or department department by department, uh, what departments are posing the highest risk, uh, what departments pose the least risk, what departments have the highest impact on total operations. Uh, that's what the gap analysis will begin to show us. Uh, you need to repeat these at least annually and often at least in the beginning more frequently to ensure that you are providing the performance and goal metrics that the senior leaders need to know and understand to be able to make the right decisions. Again, this is where methods like CMM come in. A typical approach to gap analysis is to work backwards from the endpoint to the current state. Uh, this lets us know where we are and begins to show us the roadmap of where we need to go.